Well, we talked about the standoff last week. How that uh, that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Levites and all the political uh, upper echelon were scared to death of Jesus. And he was lambasting them publicly in a tremendous way. And they just stood there and took it, not because they wanted to, because they were afraid to do anything else. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and then Matthew, the 24th chapter, we're going to study about eschatology. We're getting right into that now. Actually, Matthew 23 and 24 should be one chapter. The chapter break, it just the subject just keeps on rolling. He just folds it in. So when we come to Matthew chapter 24, realize that that really is not inspirational, that we go from chapter 23 to 24. That's just so you can find it easier, okay? Matthew 23, and let's start with, we, we went through 25 last week, but let's go back and look at it a little bit more. We had the seven woes of judgment. Jesus is ready to, he's telling them what he's going to do to them. Israel had rejected her king and her Messiah, her Messiah king. And she is going to reap what she has sown. She's going to reap. He invited them to his wedding. They weren't going to be the bride because they'd already thrown that away. She wasn't faithful. But she could have come to the wedding, but she wouldn't even come to the wedding. She wouldn't have anything to do with her Messiah King. Verse number 25 now. Ooh, ah. Say that together, remember? Ooh, ah. Ooh, ah is what? What kind of a word is that, Brother Brett? Come on now, what kind of word is it? It's a long word, about that long. Onomatopoeic word. What does onomatopoeic mean? It means something that just comes out naturally. When you hit yourself, when you fall down, oh, oh. That's basically what ooh-ah is. It's an explanation of great woe, woe, danger. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. He named them, doesn't he? And they were standing there, too. The scribes were who? Brother Bill, who were the scribes? They were a public... The county clerks. The county clerks. They were the, they were the uh, legal representatives that took down every legal thing, every birth, every marriage, every death, every divorce in every synagogue. So they were responsible to know who Jesus was. Okay? They were responsible. Put it down the way they wanted it, too. Yeah. Well, they knew who he was. They knew who he was. For you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Robbery and self-indulgence. Gabriel, have you got your Amplified Bible today? I'm going to have you come up, if that's all right. You want to come up here in a few minutes? Just wait. We'll go through a few verses. Because this ought to be good and amplified. The outside of the cup and the dish. Now, when you wash dishes, uh, who does your dishwashing at your house, Brother Roger? You do? Okay. How about you, Anna? You do your dishwashing? Do you just wash the outside of the, of the glasses? No. What's the most important? The inside, because that's where you're going to be eating your food from. That's, that's the place of contamination. But he said, you people are just like a dish that somebody, they don't wash the inside, the outside of the dish, they wash the inside. But the Pharisees had washed the outside, which is totally impractical. What you look like on the outside, there's an old term, pretty is as pretty does. You have the most beautiful woman in the world. But if she's no good, she's no good. Pretty is as pretty does. Pretty is as pretty does. They were all polished up and, and religiously beautiful, but they were corrupt. They were ugly inside. For you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but on the inside they are full of robbery. What is this word robbery? Huh? <laughs> robbery. They were thieves. They were pirates, religious pirates. 
They were religious pirates. Outlaws. And self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. You blind Pharisee. Now he must have pointed one out there just like that. Just pointing his finger. You blind Pharisee. Pointed him out. First clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. The Jew says we are circumcised. Jesus said to them what? You need to circumcise your hearts. All right? Circumcision of the flesh, Paul said, amounted to not much. But the circumcision of the heart is very important. Woe to you, scribe, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful. How many of you have been to the graveyard lately? When you go out there on Memorial Day and different time decoration days, whatever, they'll have them all cleaned up, the grass is all mowed and everything else, and, the, and people go out and they polish the headstones and things like that, but down below the headstones is still dead people, rotten bodies. In my family in Pauls Valley, Oklahoma, there's a Pauls Valley Cemetery, the Pauls Valley Family Cemetery. And over the years, it's a historical landmark. I was looking uh, yesterday, I, <clears throat> I go and see how they chase our website down sometimes. I'll go and, and look at the different feeds and find out how they're going and find it because we're way up there now. We're getting sometimes 500 visits a day on the new websites. So I'll go chase it out a little bit. And down there it gave the history of Smith Paul, my great, great, great grandfather. And it went right into the cemetery. That's the first thing it did, goes into the cemetery and starts showing all the great big monuments of the family, uh, Smith Paul and Ela Tika, or Ellen, my great, great, great grandmother, and all of them down through there, Jesse Paul and all of these people. Bill and Cindy Paul, Jesse Paul's uh, uh, headstone was completely destroyed, and they went and put a new headstone and set a new headstone in there so they'd know where he was. When Jesse got killed when he rode with Custer, they buried Jesse and they buried his horse together. Jesse was raised like an Indian. Sam Paul was raised like a white man. His brother Tecumseh McClure was raised by an Indian by his brother Tecumseh, the Indian way. And Jesse took after the Indian side of his family and Sam took after, which was my grandfather, after the white man or Smith Paul. And it told all about this in there and all the different gravestones. They polished up the high school kids and all high schools around there. They used to take them at, on field days and they go to, to Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, and they would clean up the Paul Family Cemetery because this is a national monument. This is history. Now they've got a, 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 a museum there with all of my family's history and everything there. Well, Every year, the Jews would go out, like we do in the cemeteries, and they would clean up all of the headstones. In America, when, uh, when a graveyard gets in the way, we destroy it. In, a, in the Europe and things, they don't do that. They don't do that. Brother uh, Brett was telling me that his father went out here and that at from the Union Cemetery that had taken all the old headstones and dumped them into the river. Yeah, right there by the 170. Yeah. Right yeah. Mm -hmm. They were right there on the north side. Yeah, dumped them. Dumped them here to dam up stuff. Yeah. The dumped the headstones of the people. All of Joaquin Marietta's headstones, the, the, his gang members were buried at Union Cemetery. They took history and threw it in the river. The real Zorro's gang. All of the gang members were buried out there at Union Cemetery. You're not going to find them because they're not there anymore. They disposed of them. In Europe, it's very sacred. They were uh, studying about Billy the Kid here a while back. There's a guy called Bush, Bushy Bill Roberts in uh, Hico, Texas. He claimed that he was Billy the Kid, and by, by the way, they figured it out. They probably he is Billy the Kid. 
he was real Billy, and Pat Garrett didn't really kill him. And they said, well, we could run the DNA because we know where Billy the Kid's grave is. And we know where his mother's grave was. Well, Bushy Bill Roberts said that was his aunt, but they could still trace to see if that's the DNA. So they could go find out who's buried in Billy the Kid's grave and go get find his aunt and dig her up, except there was several floods and it washed Billy the Kid's headstone away, and they don't know whether they put his headstone on the right grave or not. And then his mother, or his aunt, they had moved that graveyard, and they don't know whether they got the headstones on the right graves or not when they moved them. So it wouldn't work. <laughs> it wouldn't work. Anyway, we're talking about graves, tombs, tombstones. Verse number 27. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you like... You are like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they're all prettied up and polished. Which are on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and all kinds of uncleanliness. The Jews, uh, a priest could not go near a dead person. People die. When they die, they die of something, don't they? Something has killed them one way or another. So they have diseases or whatever. And there were laws of cleanliness in the Old Testament. Uh, you didn't go touch them. You were unclean for seven days and you washed yourself and washed everything about you. If you bought a house where a man died, you had to wash that house down. And you looked all through there, see if there was any mold, any kind of corruption in that house. Looked at it real good. And if it came out and you saw it on the walls, you scrubbed it again. If it came back, you know what you did to the house? tore the house down and burned it, the whole heap, burned it up. Corruption. Jesus said, you people are infected with corruption. You people aren't fit for humanity. Those graveyards over there, while there's Absalom's tomb over there, there's Rachel's tomb over there. You can go over there in, in the cave of Machpelah and Abraham is still there and Isaac is still there and Jacob is still there and their wives are still there. I've been there. Still there. They didn't move them. <laughs> they left them alone. Full of dead men's bones and all kinds of uncleanliness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of what? Hypocrisy. And remember what I told them a while ago when we looked up there at that word, a, a robbery? I said it was like outlawry. It was like pirates. He called them religious pirates and religious outlaws. He said you are full of hypocrisy and outlawry, lawlessness. Verse number 29. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. The prophets. When God sent a prophet to Israel, what did Israel usually do to the prophets or Judah? They murdered them. And say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in the shedding of blood of the prophets. Now remember when it said they stood there in their long robes and what was on the hem of the garments of every other one of these long robes of these Pharisees? What was the, on, the, on the hem of the garments? Their genealogies. The genealogies, the history of who they were. Jesus on his garment, he had the history of who he was on. And Jesus said, your long garments even testify that you are descendants of those murderers. And when you commit crimes, this is a terrible thing. When you commit sin in your life, when your fathers commit sin, you know what happens? I can look at people's lives. I can look at people where I grew up. Brother, Brother Bill, you probably know people in your life that you saw people that were wild that you grew up with. And they had wild children that were wilder than they were. And they had grandchildren that were wilder than they were. And it just kept on getting worse and worse and worse and more outlawry all the time. And Jesus said, you people are a bunch. He, you're ten times worse than your grandfathers. Your grandfathers killed the prophets. You killed the son, the heir. You were so bad that you saw God in the flesh and you murdered him and called for his blood. 
shedding of the blood of Caiaphas. Consequently, in verse number 31, you bear witness against yourselves that you are heirs of those who murdered the prophets. Heirs of those who murdered the prophets. In verse 31, descendants, heirs. Gabriel, have you got your little deal right? Can you bring up here and read from verse 25 down to verse number 31, if you don't mind? Talking right into this, in that Amplified Bible. From 25? Yes, 25 to 31. Okay. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but within they are full of extortion, prey, spoil, plunder, and grasping self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and of the plate, so that the outside may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, for you are like tombs that have been whitewashed, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and everything impure. Just so you also outwardly seem to, pe to people to be just and upright, but instead are full of pretense and lawlessness and iniquity. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous saying, If we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have aided them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you are testifying against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Thank you. That's a pretty good translation of it. One an explanation. Verse number 32. Verse number 32. Now let's go. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. Just fill it up. Remember, God prophesied way back to Noah that the Canaanites, when they would go into the land of Canaan, when they would go into the land of the Canaan, that they would become very wicked and uh, licentious and idolatrous and that God was going to make slaves out of them because they would build up great farms and everything else, but that God was going to take it away from them and was going to give it to Israel's descendants. He said this before these people were ever born because they knew what they'd be like. It said uh, God told Abraham that he was going to go down into Egypt and he was going to stay there 400 years, his descendants, until the iniquity would be fulfilled in the land of Canaan. The Canaanites would get terrible and terrible and terrible. And he told them, you go into that area and you kill every man, woman, and child and their dogs and cats and their animals. Oh, that's, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? But you know why? Because they were infected with disease. So badly that they had to be wiped. They had to be, the place had to be cleaned up. And when they went in there, they said, when you go into a house and you move into a house, like I said a few minutes ago, check it out if it's so diseased that these things keep coming back to call it it said leprosy in the walls he said you clean it and you wash it and if it keeps coming back tear it down and burn it and start over again verse number 33 and he calls them uh, Nahash Nahash say uh, Nahash Nahash what does Nahash mean? Nahash, what does it mean? The serpent. What does it actually mean, though? What does the name mean? It means to hiss, hiss and to whisper. We find out that Laban in the Old Testament, we're studying the book of Genesis, we find out that Laban was an idolater and that he consorted with serpents, with demon spirits. And he got prophecy from them. The soothsayers, the old, the prophets of Baal, they were all consorted with these demonic spirits. The same demonic spirit that was in the snake in the garden. Nahash. Say that again. Nahash. Whisperers. Acts 16, 16 talks about a woman that was possessed with a demon of the great Pithonah, the snake. Than the hush. It means to slander. It means to be naked. It means to be wicked. It means to lie and be deceitful. 
You uh, Nahash, you serpents, you brood of the snake, you children of the devil. You're children of the devil. You've been born of Satan. How many of you have been born of God? Hmm? Yeah, that's good. How many of you maybe have seen people that were born of Satan? Huh? Yeah, well, you had business with them before. <laughs> Brother John, Dr. John, you, you ever see somebody that you thought might be born to Satan? And, and you deal with them and you preach to them and, and uh, it's just like water off a duck's back. Leave me alone. Hurrah. Wickedness. Filled up with wickedness. Sometimes people can reject God until they're born of Satan like you're born of God. And when you're born of Satan, you know what? It's too late. It's too late. You went too far. You ever heard of the of the old term, the what the uh, the path of no return. The path of no return. You went so far that you couldn't find your way back. Oh, the point of no return. Beyond the point of no return. Beyond the point of no return. Isn't that scary? How would you like to know that you've been doomed to Gehenna forever and ever? And still alive on this land and be doomed. Twice dead, Jesus called him. Two times dead. Two times dead. You serpents, you brood of serpent of Satan, you how shall you escape the sentence of Gehenna? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill. One of them was the Apostle Paul. And Stephen. Right out there. Remember Stephen? They tried him in Sanhedrin court. They took him out at Stephen's gate. And they killed him. Murdered him. And after they murdered him, what did they do to him? Huh? What? They bit him. Thank you, young lady. You got an A plus today. Anna. They bit him with their teeth. They went and chewed on him like dogs. Like animals. Like animals. Terrible, filthy animals. And some of you... You will, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. And that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bacchariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. My grandmother used to sing a song a long time ago called The Philadelphia Lawyer. You ever heard of the Philadelphia Lawyer? She sang this song. She talked about Wild Bill that lived in Reno that was a cowboy that was a quick shot and a deadly shot. And he was out, and he, he, he fell in love with this Hollywood queen, this movie star, and she followed him up to Reno. And boy, I mean to tell you what, he was just crazy about her and lavished all types of gifts on her and everything else. And this Philadelphia Lawyer come up there doing some business up in Reno, and he saw... Wild Bill's Hollywood Queen. So he set his sights on her. And while Wild Bill was out one night out gathering cattle or doing some kind of business, he was in Wild Bill's home with a Hollywood Queen. And Wild Bill came up outside and the, he could see in the lights in the house the lamp inside was shining and they were showing their images on the windowsill. And he got out and he listened. And he heard this Philadelphia lawyer telling her that if you'll only come to me to Philadelphia, I'll make you the queen of the city. I'll let you rub elbows with the upper crust of Philadelphia. And you won't have to live in this little old one-horse town out here in Nevada. Bill listened to all of that. Well, the moral of the story is there's one less lawyer in old Philadelphia tonight. <laughs> I've been having some trouble with skunks out there my, on my place. And I talk on the radio every day, you know, get out there and tell them stories and things. I talked about killing this Philadelphia lawyer yesterday. And I went out there and, uh, and the chicken pens were kind of tore up, just dug up around the chicken pens and some chicken eggs were laying in there and they were half eaten and everything. And, and the irrigator out there, he came along and he said, Jim, 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 
he said, there's a funny looking thing. He was trying to tell me because he couldn't speak English very well. He said, black and white smells bad. Yeah, black and white. He said, he's in that hole underneath that tank over there. So I went in the house and I was shaking pretty bad. I took my blood sugar. I've been having a terrible time with high blood pressure and low blood sugar and everything else. I went in there and, and uh, I knew that he was underneath. I wanted to get back out, so I had to eat something and I got my Winchester. And I got a water hose. And I said, well, if he's underneath there, he's got to come out over here if I run the water hose over there. So I turned the water hose on and I waited over there with my trusty Winchester. And he stuck his head out, and that was the end of that Philadelphia lawyer. <laughs> that was the end of him. Boy, did he smell bad. You know, when you keep company with skunks, you smell like one. I hope it don't smell that bad today. <clears throat> but these rats here, they were all full of smell and stunk. They stunk like hell itself, the garbage pit of humanity, because that's where they were going. They smelled of it. They smelled of it. I say to you all that all these things shall come upon this generation. This brood. That's what a generation is. It's a brood. Your contemporaries. How many of you were born in 1950? How many of you were born in 1960? How many of you were born in 1970? You have a generation. Okay, that generation. I didn't say how far I was going back. <laughs> Way back yonder. Yeah, back in the 40s, you know. <coughs> That's... Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. That word, oh... Ooh ah, say that. Ooh ah, woe Jerusalem, woe to you Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I would have gathered your children together, the way a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling, you would not come. And I talked to you a lot of times about how a, a mother hen. How many of you have been out on the farm and see a mother hen with baby chickens? I can talk chicken, you know. I speak a little bit of Lakota and Greek and Hebrew and and uh, English some. Okie, actually, is what it is, Oklahoma English. And I speak chicken a little bit, too. I can go out there. How many of you have been out there with me? Yeah. Have you ever been out there when I go? <laughs> Boy, every chicken, deadless, their heads will go up because that's the sign. Come here, I got something for you. Jesus said to them, but they wouldn't come. When a chicken does that to another chicken, it means there's danger or there's something good to eat. Come here now. And they will run. They will run. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, just come out there on the farm. I'll show you. I'll prove this to you. Marilyn, am I telling the truth? Yeah. Used to when I lived up in Nevada, I had about fifty to hundred chickens running all over my place. When I moved, when I lived, when I moved up there to Nevada, I, I I lived up there, and under every tumbleweed there was there were there were scorpions and vinegarooms everywhere. You go out there at nighttime, and I mean they're crawling all over the place. I turned the chickens loose on them, and I tell you what, they'd be killing each other over a scorpion, tearing them apart. And a vinegaroon. That was like candy to them, like Snickers candy bars or chocolate. You know. Like steak, flame and yawn and lobster. Boy, I mean, I could go out there and I'd kick over a, a tumbleweed and I'd go, and I mean, tell you what, I had a guy there out there one time when I did that and the chickens came running. And you saw, ah! <laughs> All of them coming running with their heads coming right at you, you know. Scared him to death. He said, they're going to attack us. I said, no, they're after this. <laughs> this is Israel, Jerusalem, didn't have enough sense to know what was. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. 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 
completely desolate. For I say to you now, from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something today. Jews have got an awful high pride. They do. They still think they're God's people. They're not. <laughs> if they want to come to God today, they're going to have to go through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They can go out and have all their Baruch Hashem synagogues they want, but if they want to get serious with the Lord, if they want to know what the truth is, they're going to have to come to some one of God's, God's churches. That's where they're going to have to come. They're still God's nation. But God's going to have to warp them and beat the tar out of them. Their bottom ends are going to be bloody time he gets through with them through the, in the tribulation period before he can. And then they will say, blessed and holy is he that came in the Lord. They will be bawling and tears will come squirting out of their eyes. Because I'm going to tell you, it's the end. Two third, two out of every three of them is going to be dead. Chapter 24 23 didn't cease. Here we go into chapter 24, but remember, chapter the last chapter hasn't finished. Jesus is continuing what he's saying here. And Jesus, see there? That and is what? That's a conjunction. And Jesus came out of the temple and was going away. Now, by the way, he wasn't in the temple. He was in the temple area. Okay? His disciples came to the point out of the temple buildings to him. Now, who is his disciples? These are his church members. Okay. I didn't smell like a skunk when I come in here today, did I? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you go out there on the farm and you can smell that Philadelphia lawyer. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Metatate, all these things. Truly I say to you, not, not one stone here shall be left upon another which shall not be torn down. And then the Jews said, He said, He's going to tear up the whole place. No. He was going to put it in somebody's heart to tear up the whole place. How did the whole place get torn up? How did he get torn up? Because of the Jews' rebellious, hard-headed necks. They fought those Romans. The Romans tried to be fair to them. Just because they are God's people, they think they can do anything. And it's okay. It's not. Remember I told you that two of the members of the Lord's church were Sakari. What's the Sakari? The knife men, the henchmen, the, the assassins. They went out there to the, what we call Masada, the Herodian. They took that. And they would send their little henchmen down there, the Sakari out there, and they'd find a, a, a Roman soldier off someplace and stick that knife in, in the pit of his belly and turn it and kill him. Assassinate him. One by one by one by one. The Roman government finally got so mad that they decided to completely destroy all of them. God used the Roman government to bring them down. God used their hard-headedness and their wickedness. They called for the death of the Messiah King. Pontius Pilate said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They said, don't you say that. He said, what I have written, I have written. It stays. They said, just say he said he was the King of the Jews. He said, he's the King of the Jews. He was crucified because they said he, he said that he was the King of the Jews. Let's go on a little further now. Do you not see all these things? Through I say to you, not one stone here should be left upon another which will not be torn down. A.D. 70, this was going to take place. In that very generation. All right? And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, what will be these things? What will these things be? When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Here we talk about eschatology. What's eschatology? That's last thing. They wanted to know about eschatology. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. <coughs> Jesus called out one assembly. 
in his ministry, not 45,000, one assembly. He gave it the right and the administration of his kingdom. And every time God does something, what does Satan do, Brother Art? He imitates it. He's got a copycat. It. In Egypt, when Moses had Aaron throw his rod down and it turned to an, into a snake, what did the devil do in his crowd? They threw their staffs down and they became snakes. But I'm going to tell you something. God is powerful. Their snakes became the miraculous. They performed miracles. The devil performs miracles. It says in the last days, the devil's crowd will perform miracles. All right? Do great signs and wonders. But whose snake ate all the rest of them? Aaron's snake ate all the rest of those snakes. In other words, God is more powerful. Okay? We see all of this. And in the last days, there are going to be many, many denominations to confuse the masses. To confuse and manipulate the masses. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. How many of you have studied the church history classes I taught the 26? We, uh, the last time I studied all of those, those, Brother Bill, you were here. Remember how America was founded? America was a church state nation. Did you know that? There was no freedom of religion here in America. People holler about the nation was established on freedom of religion. That's baloney. They, it only, it only, if anybody believes that, they don't know history. Every state was a, every state in, over here, every colony had a state church. And if you, you belonged to that church only, if you didn't, how many of you, when you went to school, did you, did you study when they took the people out and dunked them and they put them in stocks and stuff? You know most of that dunking, when they dunk somebody, they take them on a, a fulcrum. They have a river out here, okay? And over here on the bank of the river, they have a, a device, and out here is a, a cheer. And they have guys over here, and, they, and they, in this cheer in here, they tie a person in it. And they take them, and they dunk them in the river. How many of you have heard of that in, in history, yeah. early American history? Yeah. You know who they were dunking? Yeah. Baptist. You know why they were dunking them? because they were baptizing people that came out of their churches because the Baptist said you don't have any authority to baptize anybody we're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ we come down through all ages we have the authority you can believe whatever you want to but when your people come to us we're going to baptize them not again that's how the Baptist got the name Anabaptist and then short to the form of Baptist they took them out there and they would dunk them until they were dead they'd baptize them to death they put them in stocks. They do every every colony was a church state except which colony? Which was the experiment? Which one was the experiment? Roger Williams and Doctor John Clark. Roger Williams, he was a Baptist for a little while. Doctor John, Rhode Island, that's right, Rhode Island, and they went. Roger Williams and Doctor John Clark went to England, petitioned that they could have one colony that was a free colony. In America and that would be Rhode Island and they said just look we'll show you but what happened later on with freedom of religion comes freedom of heresy <laughs> also you know why we got you know why America was a seed pot of uh, cults and isms because of that very we have freedom of religion I have never persecuted one Jehovah Witness did you know that they don't want to see me coming I am famous among Jehovah Witnesses brother Allen Wagner out here, I call him Alan. Everybody else calls him Al Wagner because I knew him when he was young, okay? I was his pastor a long time ago. Brother Alan Wagner was over there in the hallway one time. He said, come here, Brother Jim. And he was introducing him to a missionary. He said, this boy is a Greek scholar. He said, there's not a Jehovah Witness can stand 10 minutes in his, in his presence till he wipes all of their theology completely out. It's gone. It's erased. They have no chance. Brother Art, I went to one of your friend's house one time. I got down. How long do those Jehovah Witnesses last, brother, before they hit the door? 
gone, boy. I mean, they don't want, to. they will not take the truth. Just forget it. You hold them on John 1 1, John 1 14, John 1 18. You don't need to go anyplace else in the Bible. Don't let them go anywhere else. Just hold them to that because I'll tell you what, Jesus is Jehovah. If they want a chance to stay out of hell, which they don't believe in, they better trust in that Jehovah God that they say they believe in. If they don't trust in Jesus, they have no chance. False religion. See to it that no one believes you. He said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Herbert Armstrong said when he started preaching that the gospel hadn't been preached for 1,800 years. I believe what Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18. He said, You're Peter, but upon this rock I'll be building my church, and the gates of hell cannot wrestle her down. I'll guarantee you the gospel was preached for 1,800 years. It may have been persecuted heavily, but it's been preached. It may have had to go on the ground, but it's been preached. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars and see to it no one be frightened, for these th those things must take place. But that's not yet the end. How would you like to have been a Baptist back there in the dark ages that the Catholic Church brought in? You would have thought the Antichrist was on the scene, wouldn't you, the old Pope? For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against nation, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Boy, that sounds like, yeah, that sounds like 2012, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, these things are going to happen. But all these things are mere, merely the beginning of birth pains. These are the beginning of birth pains. The beginning of birth pains. Verse number 9. Then they will deliver you up to the tribulation. Now, what in the world is that talking about? We change subjects right here. We go from the disciples in the church to Israel itself. They were all Jewish, weren't they? They were all Jewish. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation. He goes to Israel. And deliver it to their tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Lawlessness will increase. How in the world? Terrible. Lawlessness. There was one time there was a garbage pit of humanity where all the outlaws ran in America in the early 1800s. History has been, a lot of history has been written about that. It was called a no man's land. A lot of movies have been written about it. What was that called? What was that place called? Called the nations, wasn't it? They took a place, a wild area, and they moved all from Andrew Jackson had the Indian Removal Act, and they moved all the Indian tribes, and they put them in what they called the Indian Territory or the Territories. And out in the Territories, the Indians, every little Indian nation had its own law. The Cherokees, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Osage, whatever. They had their own laws, Potawatomies, whatever. And they had Indian marshals. And my great grand, great 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 grandfather, Smith Paul, was an Indian marshal. Tecumseh McClure was an Indian marshal. Tom Waite was an Indian marshal. And then their children, Fred Waite, which you hear about, you know, the one that fought the Lincoln County War, and Sam Paul, the, the book that uh, Shadow of Indian Star and True Grit and all that's written about. And they were what was called uh, detriments to the outlawry in Indian Territory. They said Sam Paul was the greatest deterrent to crime in Indian Territories that there was. The President of the United States, after old uh, Isaac Parker, sentenced him to 10 years in the Detroit Detention House for murdering a white outlaw. They turned him loose and said that he had been a great deterrent to crime in Indian Territory and putting him in prison for killing that outlaw 
was terrible. The President of the United States said that and wrote the letter. I have the letter. Lawlessness will be increased. In these last days, we don't have Indian Territory. We got Bakersfield. We got Los Angeles. We got San Francisco. We got Lamont. We got Arvin. Every city is a place of lawlessness. All over. Verse number 13. But the one who endures to the end, it sh he shall be saved. Who's this talking to again? It's not talking about salvation, is it? Hmm. What's it talking about? The one that makes it to the end of the tribulation period is going to be saved. The, the Jews are going to make it. How many are going to be killed? Two-thirds of them. But the one that makes it in the end, he will be saved, and he'll get to go into the millennial reign in his body. And he will get to be an administrator of God's kingdom on the earth, but he's got to have his mind changed first. He's got to have his mind changed first. Verse number 14, Then this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world for witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. That's where we're going to finish for this week. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are in the hands of Nahash. Say that. Nahash. If you're out there through the Internet where these videos will go and these audios, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're not doing your own thing. You're doing Satan's thing. You are in the hands of a monster. We don't do our own thing. We don't live our own thing. One time, a few decades ago, there was a great singer that sang, I did, my, I did it my way. He didn't do it his way. You did it Satan's way. Whatever we do in this world, we think we're doing our thing. It's not our thing. It's Satan's thing. Sometimes we have to get educated, don't we? Have, have you come in your life, is there a point in your life where you knew the Lord, where you come and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and save my soul because of what Jesus did? You've got to believe that Jesus is God, first of all. That's the only ticket out of hell, is that believing that Jesus is God the Son. Not a God, not a Son, but God the Son. The God the Son. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The creator of the heavens and the earth came down here and parked himself for 33 and a half years in the armpit of society, in the religious society. And they did everything to him, spit on him. He wallowed with those Philadelphia lawyers, those skunks. But he came out not smelling like that. When you keep company with skunks, you smell like one, they say. But Jesus didn't. He didn't. If you don't know the Lord today, you bow your head and you ask him to forgive your sins and to save your soul because of what Jesus did. Because without Jesus, you have no hope. No hope. We'll start out 24 and verse 15 next week. Brother Bill, is it your turn? Brother, who's coming up here? Thank you for enduring those hard seats. Gabrielle, thank you for coming up here and reading for us. Jim, I went back. When I went, the last time I went back, I was in Charleston, so I think I'm absolutely there. Some of yours, probably. Some of yeah. uh, we stopped at Jim Village Kids 